We, be we began in 1988 as the North Carolina Center for Creative Retirement and joined the nationwide network of 121 OSHER institutes in 2012. Our mission is to provide opportunities to thrive in life's second half through programs in lifelong learning, leadership, service, and research. Through Monday, August 17th, we are holding online registration for our fall 2020 courses, which will be held online beginning Monday, September 14th. Please visit our website at olliashville.com for more information or email us at olli at unca.edu. It is about registration, the online registration process, scholarships, or teaching at OLLI. We plan an active series of programs throughout the fall, including four more presentations in this series, and we hope you will join us for as many as possible. Today's program is the first in a series of webinars that have been designed by OLLI at UNC Asheville's Inclusion Committee. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the historic and current inequities created by systemic racism have been illuminated. The disproportionate impact on communities of color are strikingly visible in the areas of healthcare, criminal justice, education, and economics. And we will address each of those areas in the series. Each session in the series will include presentations and conversations by local leaders, professionals, and Asheville Buncombe community members in their respective roles engaged in addressing these issues. The presentation of the series is an effort to raise awareness and to inspire personal engagement and advocacy. Many thanks to Wallace Bohannon, Jane Callis, Bill Carpenter, Larry Haas, Sam Harbin, Annie Houle, Morgan Jackson, Sarah Reinke, and Dana Zarr the members of Ollie's Inclusion Committee for their thoughtful work in putting the series together. I also want to thank Ollie Facilities and Communications Coordinator Jacqueline Lowe for her work teaching us about web webinars and organizing the publicity for this series. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sharon West, who will discuss cultural humility, mitigating race-based inequities. Dr. West is an international speaker and published author focusing on culturally appropriate approaches to medical care and healthcare disparities. Among her many professional achievements and positions, Dr. West serves as an appointee by Governor Cooper on the North Carolina Commission of Public Health, as well as the North Carolina Minority Health Council. Thank you so much, Dr. West, for being the first speaker in this series and for all the work you do to make our community a more informed and equitable place. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to the whole OLLI team. And what I'm going to do is try and navigate through this so you all be patient with me as I switch the screens because I don't want you looking at me. So I want you to focus on what we're talking about. And um, so let me do that right now. Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. Hopefully it's a single slide. Is that correct? Looks great. Okay, perfect. Yay. I love to hear those words. So welcome everyone. And um, I want this to be a time where you can relax and enjoy. And um, as was mentioned earlier, to um, just kind of save your questions to the end because I want to get to that. So I'm, I'm trying to move through this. It may seem a little bit fast, but I think we can make it. We can do it. I want to set the stage and prime the canvas, if you will, and just allow us to embrace this moment because with the information that I'm sharing today, remember that we all are coming from a different place, a different space of awareness some are coming with a place in a place of empathy that you're hearing um, information you're seeing the media there's a lot of things that's going on and you get it so you're empathetic with this is heart work h-e-a-r-t heart work and then some are coming into this virtual space in more of a cerebral intellectual con concept or a connection meaning that you hear it, you see it, you know, people have told you about 
what's happening in our country now and the racial inequities on many levels. Um, but it sticks as cerebral. It's not a heart thing just yet. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing at all. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, you know, where we are and what's happening. And I want you to feel comfortable with it. And then um, we'll move on and we'll get to some other information. Okay. So I'm not sure if you've seen this before. The Institute of Medicine made this statement many years ago, and it says the historical context shapes contemporary structures. And I like this statement, but I added something to it too, based on what we're talking about today. And that is historical context shapes contemporary structures of human hierarchy. What does that mean? What that means is that what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Unless we intentionally right the moral wrongs, then history will repeat itself relative to ideology, those things that we have created in our minds based on information that we receive, which then generates the practice. Let's talk about that a little bit more. So we can't get into this discussion of what we're going to talk about today, of cultural humility, the primary focus, without starting and giving you a little bit of historical perspective, the historical context, if you will. So the chattel slavery was from 1619 to 1865, and we've heard all about this. We, we learned so much about it, and there's still so much more we don't know about it, but we know that it was a heinous thing in, in society, a heinous part of our history. There were approximately 4 million slaves during this 1619 to 1865 period. Slaves are people from African descent, and what I'm talking about now is how this ideology uh, presented itself in the early days. They presented themselves, or people described them as non-human, property, they were not considered people, animalistic, uh, not to be trusted. Then, And the people who owned slaves put in the psyche of many people in the era during that time that there could be a rebellion, a fear of rebellion from the slaves because of the severe oppression. So they're to be feared, but do not allow them to know that we are afraid of them. And they must be controlled under every circumstances. So we cannot allow them any type of independence whatsoever um, because these are property. And what was connected to the property? Money. It was about economics. So and then there was this rule, it was called the three-fifths rule. Now here again, I'm painting the ideology, you know, the dehumanization, the devaluing of people of African descent. 1619, it really started a little bit earlier than that, but let's just stick with these dates. The three-fifths rule, now that is a little bit different than what I had originally heard about the three-fifths rule. But after further research and reading what other people had written, the three-fifths rule was about votes. It was about seats. It was about power. So what was the three-fifths rule? The three-fifths rule says that um, the, the South um, was wanting to get more seats in Congress. They were wanting to get more power, more monies funneled to the South. And they said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to count our slaves. And therefore, if we count our slaves, then that means we will have a great chance of getting more votes, we'll get more power, and we'll get more money coming to the, to the South. Well, the North said, no, you can't do that because you don't count slaves as human. You don't even consider them as people. You consider them as animals. So then a compromise ensued, and the compromise was, okay, this is what we'll do. Three out of every five slaves we will count as human. Now, I want you to know this. Even though this was somewhat of the beginnings of dehumanization of people of African descent, the valuelessness, you know, three, we'll count every five, out of five people, we'll count three as human. Um, I want you to know there were abolitionists throughout all of this, okay? There were people who had voices who were totally against slavery. There were white people who were powerful, but just not powerful enough to be able to overrule the creation of the ideology of the valuelessness of people of African descent. So let's proceed. So 
1865, slavery ends and Reconstruction era begins. What is the Reconstruction era? The Reconstruction era was, in my opinion, even after I look, as I look at today, the, the uh, Reconstruction era was a time where egalitarian rule was at its best, its most prominent. Why is that? Because after slavery ended, as you see here, the Civil War ends, the amendments were passed, and I'm talking about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, allowing um, people of African descent who were former slaves to hold political office, they could buy, be in their own businesses, they could be educated, they could marry, because remember, slaves were not human, so slaves could not be in, in a marriage, so now they can do all these things. And federal troops were sent in on the, on the federal level, they were sent in to various locations throughout the South to make sure that people of African descent, the former slaves, were not terrorized by certain groups. As you know, the South was not exactly happy about the Reconstruction era, about the end of slavery. They were just fuming about this. And so this went on for approximately 11 years. People were gaining, they were gaining their citizenship and just to have the federal troops there in place to make sure that they were on the path to full citizenship, it was wonderful, it was great. Can't, come, can't see a period in time now where this has ever gotten to this level as what it was uh, during the Reconstruction era, but guess what? In 1877, Reconstruction era ends, that's right when the federal troops pulled out because on the national level they felt okay so we've got the troops in there everything's going good the troops are not reporting that much terrorism so we can pull out the north got disinterested in continuing to protect that because they felt everything was in order and so they pulled out and they wanted to focus more on industry and when those federal troops pulled out of there guess what it went crazy just 11 years after. So this is what came, the, the rise of the KKK, the black codes, the red coats started. The Democratic Party created the Ku Klux Klan in that day in 1860, I mean 1878, 1877. Why did they do this? To become terrorist groups to prevent the African-American or the Black people, the Black population from voting. Because see, the majority of Black people that time were Republican. They were business owners, they were self-fulfilling, they, you know, had this displayed moral fiber. They were just trying to become a part of citizenship. So the Democratic Party felt we need to terrorize them, we need to keep them from voting. But also, the businesses that they had, the Black people had created, they were very prosperous businesses. And the white business owners were threatened by the economy generated uh, through the Black businesses. And so they wanted to shut those businesses down and do everything they could to reverse what was gained during the, um, during that, the Reconstruction era. So here it again, over 4,000 African-Americans were lynched between 1877 and 1950 in the South. That's a lot. So here we go to this statement again. Historical context shapes contemporary structures. You know, we go back to this picture. Look at this little girl on the right, you know, facing this slide. Look at the smile, the smirk, if you would, on her face. What is this message to her? What is that meant? Is that her dad is standing behind her in the white pants and the straw hat? You know, what did he tell her about this man that's strung up there, this black man? And what, what is this? And look how they're dressed. It's like an event. The lynching was a type of event, a family event that they come out to. And then you see other girls, young ladies on the left side facing the screen who look like they're totally disgusted at what was going on. They don't want to be there. So the message is, is what, you know, creates the ideology. So the script is what I want to talk about. When we talk about the message, I want to talk about the script concerning Black people. You know, when I talked earlier in prior slides about what the thought process was that Black people will probably seek revenge for the years of slavery and that they're uncivil, that they're animalistic, and we must keep our eyes on them and show them we are in control in the South of Black people, then, you know, that is the beginning of the shaping of the ideology of the valuelessness of Black people that we see reproduced today. 
So here's a definition of racist. This is kind of a little bit of mine and a little bit of somebody else's, a couple of other people that I kind of put it together that made sense to me. A racist is a person who demonstrates prejudice towards another based on the belief or ideology of a superior race over another, thus morally justifying the oppression of the lesser race. And we have many examples of that I'm gonna talk about in the, in the next slide. But then let's look at the definition of racism. Racism is a system, a system. So you have the ideology that has been a, like a script that has been handed to us throughout the generations, an ideology of what certain groups are like characteristically, okay? So then once this ideology is created, then a policy is formed, a policy is written. And when a policy is written to reinforce, that policy drives the practice. And then that practice normalizes inequities. Let's talk a little bit more about this. So Dr. Cameron Jones, who resides in Atlanta, and I've had the privilege of uh, being with her on a couple of occasions, um, she describes racism as being on three different levels. The individual level, the institutional level, the internalized level. So the individual level is described as the valuing of an individual or group based on their membership in a particular group. Remember the picture that has been painted about certain groups. They don't do this, they do this, they're lazy, they're not to be trusted, they're feared, all that just kind of paints that picture. And then institution, and then we have examples, of course, like Bull Connery, you've heard of, probably hear a lot recently about what happened in Mississippi many years ago, but the voice of Bull Connor and George Wallace. How about 1963 when George Wallace said, in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw a line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. These are individuals who display racism, racist. And then institutional racism is a system, just talked about that, a system that assigns value and allocates opportunity based on skin color. And of course, some of the most prominent examples would be slavery. Slavery was legal. Um, segregation, segregation was legal. And what about today? Racial profiling, mass incarceration of black and brown people. You know, it's interesting that Black and brown people make up 25% of the United States population, but yet represent close to 60% of the incarcerated population due to harsher sentences and just discriminant uh, choices that are made, or indiscriminate, should I say. And then internalized racism. This is the real Black-on-Black -black crime the process by which people of color adopt racially prejudiced attitudes and behaviors that lead to discrimination and stereotyping of their own racial group. So let me tell you this, and, and some of you may be familiar with this. So back in the day, there were elite black organizations, okay? And there were criteria that must be met before a person would be considered as a member of this um, organization, of these very elite organizations of, of the Black communities. And two of the tests were, number one, the paper bag test, and the second was the ruler test. The paper bag test said, you know, the color of a paper bag, the brown one, uh, the brown paper bag, that color's been the same as long as I remember. But if your skin color was darker than a paper bag, you probably would not be admitted into this organization. The ruler test is a test that showed how close to white you were. So if your hair was straight as a ruler, then you would have a good chance of being selected for this organization. And I remember growing up in Asheville, because Asheville's my home, and I remember saying growing up, and it was like this, if you black, get back. If you brown, stick around. If you white, you are right. Do you know that even today, these intra intra racial hierarchies remain? People who are lighter have a tendency to be more accepted within and outside of groups, um, and more accepted and more trusted than people who are darker. 
and we can talk about slavery and how that worked with who worked in the house and who worked in the fields relative to that. But wanna let you know, this is deeply ingrained and has been reproduced through generations as well. Very interesting concept on that. This is just a picture taken from Durham, North Carolina of Jim Crow. You're familiar with Jim Crow laws um, as we move into the 40s and to the 50s. Uh, Jim Crow laws were here again, it was created by Democratic Party to disenfranch and remove um, the political and economic gains of black people that were gained during that reconstruction period. They still have a vengeance against the white, the black people for the successes they had. So it's reinforcing the separation. And then we had Hill Burton that said separate but equal. And we all know separate can never be equal. So if you hear stories from African Americans who lived during that time, you're, you'll hear stories about, yes, we had separate bathrooms, separate waiting rooms, as you see here, um, you know, separate uh, reception areas and, and all of these things, separate water fountains. But these places that were put aside for Black people were usually less maintained. It was poor, the housing, the, the neighborhoods, you name it, it was worse than what the white people um, received far as their share of separate. It was not equal by any means. And what's interesting is Dr. Martin Luther King, three years after the Civil Rights Act passed in 1967, Dr. King said this, and, okay, so this is what he said, of the good things in life, the Negro has approximately one half those of whites. Of the bad things of life, he has twice those of whites. Thus, half of all Negroes live in substandard housing, and Negroes have half the income of whites. When we view the negative experiences of life, the Negro has a double share. There are twice as many unemployed. The rate of infant mortality among Negroes is double that of whites. Really, guess what? I can take this quote right here, right now, and place it in today's up-to-date contemporary structure as we describe the differences, the disparities between white and African Americans, Hispanic and, and white. You know, all of these disparities still exist. And it's worse, actually. It's worse. I'm going to show you that on the slide that's coming up. So you've heard of implicit bias. Implicit bias. What does implicit bias have to do with this? So I'm taking you up to contemporary now, because this is when we're hearing so much more about implicit bias. Implicit bias is described as unconscious stereotypes against others based on association. Implicit bias is all about association. Let's, let's do an activity. So I want you to roll with me here, okay? So I want you to tell me what word goes into the blank. What word goes into this blank? Night and, black and, young and. Okay, so you probably caught that up, you know, caught onto that pretty quickly, you know, night and day, black and white, young and old, because of association, of, you know, about, what we're familiar with. So take a look at this one. This is called unconscious cognition. Okay, what is unconscious cognition? Unconscious, unconscious cognition says that even though many of these words are misspelled, because of nothing that we do, our brain goes into the, uh, goes into the mode to make it right. And it says that our minds automatically, without our conscious control, allows us to read this. Can you read that? Can you understand what that is? Most of us can figure that out and figure it well. When I put read further on the research of how our brain is able to do this, if the first letter and the last letter are in the correct order, our brain takes care of the rest and putting that sentence together. So I think that's, I love doing that because I got it. I guess maybe that's why I like it. So. This is another activity. I want you to um, do this with me, okay? Participate with me on this. I want you to state the color of the word, not the word. State the color of the word and not the word. Okay, how did you do on that? You state the color of the word, not the word. Was that pretty simple? Okay, here's part two of this. 
Again, directions are the same. State the color of the word, not the word. How many of you found that to be a little bit more challenging? So in the first slide, it was pretty simple. You agree with that because the colors match the words. So this was about implicit association. Remember, implicit is about association. So we had an inclination to read the word and what we read aligned with what we saw explicitly, the color. But on this slide, it probably took a little bit longer because it conflicted with the association of the color. So that caused some conflict. But you know, there's a whole science about this. And, and this is how we get to the association, the ideology, the stereotype and all this. It's a whole science on, on implicit bias and the science of inhibitory ability. So when faces of black people are shown to a, a group of white people just participating, and there are many studies that done this, that's, that's done this, um, but when pictures of black faces are shown to a group of white people, white participants, then 85% of the white participants demonstrated negative associations with the black faces. There were negative words, there were positive words, and so 85% of those people across the board that participate in this identify, associated, I should say, black faces with negative outcomes. But this is what's really interesting. There was that 10 to 15 percent of white participants who showed no negative associations to black faces. And the studies um, pretty much concluded that those who have the ability to inhibit and, and not showing that uh, discriminatory uh, preference or not showing uh, associating black faces with negative associations those people who can do that also tend to not be prejudiced against black people because they demonstrated this at a time when they could control that they knew how to inhibit those um, ideologies from presenting negative outcomes on those faces and so remember as we talk about um, bias um, implicit bias bias is about internalized stereotypes and not reflective of our intent. We all have bias of some sort on some level. Um, and so implicit bias can be turned on even in the most sincere of interactions or intentions. So that's interesting to know the, the studies. I love those. So here's implicit bias on a medical level okay so we're talking about health we can talk about some health disparities i'm going to show you some uh, based on bias when we look at some of the studies that were done in the past so here is a, a diagram that i really like and it shows implicit bias so a, a provider a nurse doctor whomever comes in and they see a patient and that cd in the brain starts turning starts spinning concerning a stereotype based on association. That association could be media, could be the movies, could be the culture, could be you know people in their group, um, and that is turned on. And that in turn creates a perception of this person based on that bias, whatever that bias is. And then that perception is then um, influences how that provider, that nurse, whoever that uh, healthcare professional, professional is, can influence communication, can influence how a person is diagnosed, and also clinical decision making. And then of course can um, inadvertently affect health outcomes, more negative health outcomes, health inequities, if you will. So here's some other biases. Bias shapes contemporary structures. Based on that um, implicit bias and their perception and then all those other things we just talked about. White Americans have seven times the wealth of African Americans and five times the wealth of Latinx families. So you may say, well, I don't have that kind of wealth. But let me tell you, um, come, you know, this research that was done, you know, the majority of the participants, yes, 
and based on all these economic studies that are just phenomenal, um, it is true, seven times as much wealth uh, that the white Americans have. African Americans with severe depression are more likely to be misdiagnosed as having schizophrenia. Patients of color are more likely to be blamed for being passive with their health care. And then African-American babies are dying at four times that of their white counterpart before one year of age in Buncombe County. African-American mothers are dying at 243% more than white mothers during or soon after birth. And here's some other, I'm just bit different discrepancies and biases. This geneticist from UC Berkeley talked about race and racism. He said, race is not something our chromosomes do to us. Race is something we do to each other. Isn't that interesting? the internal messages, the internal negative messages that can influence an outcome. Here's a diagram that we already saw that we're very familiar with. Remember that there is a belief in a system of oppression. It's real. No hatred, no ignorance. Most of these policies, ideologies were created by people who were people who were influential, people who had money, people who had platforms, people who have power, positions of power, that creates the ide ideology will get that into policy that will drive the practice and will normalize, will cause the inequities to be normalized, a part of society. When we look at health inequities, this is how we define health inequities, the presence of avoidable differences, not allowing for attainment of people to flourish, a presence of avoidable differences and health equity is the absence of avoidable differences, allowing for attainment of highest level of health for all people, allowing people to flourish. That's health equity. The Institute of Medicine, you may be familiar with this, did a study in 2000 because they heard about these murmurs that people, these murmurs that people were saying in the South and even across the North that people of color, communities of color were not receiving equitable care. They felt like they were not receiving quality care and they wanted to report this. So the United States Congress said, we're gonna fund this. We need to put this to rest. This is 2000 after all. Let's put this to rest that people can access and go and get the care that they need anywhere. Let's put this to rest. So we're going to give you two years to study this. They came back in two years with a 700-page report that you can read online. It's called Unequal Treatment Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. At no cost to read it. This is the executive summary. Well, a little snippet of it. Racial and ethnic minorities experience a lower quality of health services and are less likely to receive even routine medical procedures than are white Americans based on provider bias Remember that diagram I showed about the implicit bias that affects the communication? Also is based on distrust of institutions and look, implicit bias. This is in 2002. This is still real today. I love this definition by the World Health Organization on um, wellness. It's a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. This is a human ecology model that talks about the social contributors of health. Here's policies, look at the bottom, politics at the bottom. Um, look about the ecosystems, the system, system. Remember I said racism is about system. All those that influence the individual in the middle. These are the social contributors of health, where folks eat, where folks live, they play, they pray, they work. It's all a part of the system that determines these negative outcomes on a, especially a community of people, a group of people. So we talk about culture humility. Dr. Jan Garcia, who's one of the founders of this, um, this theory of uh, culture humility, she says, culture humility means to practice um, and to maintain a willingness to suspend what you know. So in order to practice cultural humility, we must be willing to suspend what we know or what we think we know about a person based on generalizations um, about their culture. Meaning we cannot share, we cannot talk about someone else's lived experiences. Cultural humility is about humbling ourselves. So here's the elephant in the room. Who am I to you? Who am I to you? So cultural humility is about three tenets. It's about self-reflection. It's about uh, acknowledging and mitigating the power imbalance or the privilege imbalance. And it's about advocating for and maintaining institutional accountability. So let's talk about the first one. 
Who am I to you? Remember that elephant in the room? And can I trust you? So those people that you are on committees with, those people in your neighborhood, that black family that moved across the street from you or down the street, where you go and do your banking and your business. When you see those people that look differently from you, what they're asking you is who am I to you? And then what you should be asking yourself is who are they to me? What do I know about them? And then whatever I've heard about them, because that CD is now spinning in my head, um, how do I know that it's true? These are questions we need to be asking myself. And can I trust you is what that person will be asking of you, not verbally, but in their mind. Can I trust you? Or will the information that I share with you be used against me at some point in time? So it's about self-reflection and self-exploration. This is what Culture Humility Tenant 1 is about. Tenant 2 is about acknowledging and mitigating the power imbalance. So we know that as a person of, of color, a person of color is a major, as a minority, right? This is what our society says, we are a minority. But if you're coming in as a person of power, what can you do to mitigate that power imbalance knowing that? You should look at that person who looks differently than you as a person you're wanting to learn from, you want to listen, you want to learn from that person. And then that person is a cultural expert, is gonna bring you information that they want you to know and then look at this you're the cultural expert the learner as developing a dynamic partnership that's what we want to gain out of this is a partnership by listening because power imbalances obstruct our view we don't want to feed into society's um, depiction that these people are the less the lesser than and the least likely let's mitigate that imbalance and then advocating for and maintaining um, institutional accountability. What does this look like? So in those committees, on those boards, where you bank, where you go to the store, where you get your, your medicines for pharmacy, what do these people look like? You know, and then are they representative of the communities that commonly uh, visit or that these these institutions, these organizations, these stores, I mean, the people that are coming there, do the staff mimic or even look like those people they commonly encounter? You know, what's happening here? Start asking questions. Why don't we have a uh, black pharmacist or Hispanic pharmacist? Why do we not see any black people or Hispanic people or Asian people working in my doctor's office? Ask questions about that. And then it's your organizations where you are working or have worked. Who's making the decisions? Who's, the, who's writing the policies? Who are these decision makers? What does your leadership look like? You know, it is very important that these institutions mimic culture humility. It needs to start. It needs to start with our institutions and making sure we as a people hold them accountable. So you didn't think you were going to have homework, I'm certain. So you do have homework. Here are some books that I would love for you to take time to read. I'll give you three years to read that. You never know where you'll see me in three years. But these are some phenomenal books stamped from the beginning by Dr. Kendi, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. The new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander, who was here about three, two or three years ago and spoke in Asheville at UCA and talking about mass incarceration. Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson. I got an email from him just this morning. He talks about justice. And then White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. And then I Am Not Your Negro by James Baldwin, who was, that was produced like in the 1950s. However, um, his, the documentaries on Netflix now, and there's a book and I watched the def documentary, it's phenomenal please, please watch that documentary or read the book. Your homework over the next three years. Dr. Cornell West says this, empathy is not simply a matter of trying to imagine what others are going through, but having the will to muster enough courage to do something about it. In a way, empathy is predicated upon hope. That's my story and I am open to taking any questions. Thank you so much for listening. Dr. West, 
Yes. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. There are actually no specific questions at this point. Okay. Um, thank you, though, for speaking to us. And I'm going to uh, turn you back over to Catherine. Thank you. And we'll accept comments, too. Somebody may want to put a comment in there. <laughs> well, somebody called you a rock star, and I totally agree. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I feel like I was a little rushed and I probably, there's so much to talk about, you know, but, and, and, and Catherine, you'll probably share this, that they can reach out to me or, you know, however you want it done. It's fine. Okay. Absolutely. And I also just want to thank you so much for um, a really informative and inspiring talk, getting us to think about how we do the, the hard work and the heart work. I like that distinction very much. Um, we, um, we also, I took down the information about the um, books that you recommended, so um, I will post your homework on the OLLI website. Um, we will also post the recording of this um, webinar on the OLLI website, and if you received information about today's um, webinar, we'll be posting that as soon as we can. Um, we also um, hope that you'll join us next week on Tuesday. August 18th at 1 p.m. for the second program in this series, uh, including the invisible race, place, and faith in rural Western North Carolina. We'll feature um, Dr. Amina Batata of UNC Asheville's Faculty in Health and Wellness Promotion, Joanna Greer McEachin, Dir uh, Executive Director of the Asheville Buncombe Institute of Parity Achievement, ABIPA and Jill Frumwick, who is a social epi epidemiologist and research scientist at MAHAC. They will be discussing structural race, uh, racism in the healthcare system, introduce the uh, details of their recent studies, and also be available for follow-up discussion and questions. If you do have a question about today's program, I hope that you'll email us at Olli, O-L-L-I, at unca.edu, and we will share those questions with Dr. West and post her um, responses. Um, I really want to thank you for being part of this first in our series of webinars on disparities created by systemic racism. We hope you're inspired to know more and do more to address these issues in your own life and in our community. And it looks like we've gotten a lot of questions coming in since we closed this down. So maybe Jane, would you like to come back on and see if um, there are... Um, uh, yes, I was just scrolling through them. Um, many of them, uh, actually um, one person said, I've had it come up many times with recent movements to pay honorariums to people of color to acknowledge the way systematic racism is impacting communities of color. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this. So I'm thinking honorariums may mean reparations. Is this I think person? Okay, okay. So my thoughts is, you know, how can you go back and you can't cut a check, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yes. But what the plan is, and I'm not on that committee for the city in how to do the rest reparations, but I understand the plan is to place, um, you know, to fund those areas where it's been obviously disparate in far as housing, education, you know, those kind of things like that, different areas. And I know that there is a committee that's even started or will be, you know, created just to address exactly what we want that to look like. So, um, and what my thoughts are about it, I think it's a great idea. We need to focus on those things. It's been dismissed too long and we can use the power and the privilege of the majority to help us to make the wrongs right. And just the activity of showing that, you know, there's an interest, because it's one thing to say that we approve reparations, but it's another thing to act on it. What does that look like? And so hopefully they'll come out with more definition of, of you know, what that's gonna look like for us. But thank you for that question. Um, I have another question for you. Um, one of our attendees uh, wrote in and she said, what can I do in my own community? I'm a 60 year old white woman that have empathy, but not skills. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your empathy. And I appreciate your question as well. 
So in one of the latter slides, and I, I feel like I rushed through a lot because this is like a whole day workshop really on culture humility and how we can do better. Um, and what I talked about in that slide very briefly is look around at where you spend your money. Culture humility is about self-reflection. It's about making yourself the learner rather than feeling like you have to have the answers or that you're coming in with privilege and power and not saying that this is intentional. Because remember, implicit is not intentional. It's not based on intent. So look and see where you're spending your money and seeing if they're, if it's representative of people that, that you commonly encounter or that those populations that are commonly encountered in our group. And then start asking questions in the community of those people where you're spending money. When you go to the grocery store, just kind of look around. When you go to the doctor's office, when you go to the pharmacy, you know, when you go to offices, you know, for business meetings or whatever, where are the people other than the African Americans that are cleaning up, no disrespect to service level people that are keeping our buildings clean. But what I'm saying is, there are people who definitely qualify for positions of power, decision-making, you know, that can help influence some of these policies. Remember, it's the ideology, and long time ago, it was said that certain groups of people were not intelligent. They, were, they are the least, the least likely, the unlikely, and so they're not in positions of power, but we know that's a fallacy. So start asking questions. I want to see more people of color. I want, you know, that represent our or this organization. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of our attendees asked if you would talk a little bit about growing up in Asheville. Growing up in Asheville was interesting. Well, you know, I felt like I had a good life, but I remember segregation. I do mm -hmm. remember segregation. I remember when I was in the, um, I want to say the seventh grade. I'm not sure how many is on this call that remember David Miller Junior High School. It was on College Street. Well, I grew up in a segregated elementary school. And then in the fifth grade, we were alerted that we will be going to a different school. It will be an integrated school. Now I'm in my 60s, so yeah, I'm not going to tell you how long it was. So anyway, <laughs> Um, so my mother, I didn't really know what that meant. I mean, I know we would be with the white kids, but I didn't really know the impact of that. I didn't know what to expect. My mother cushioned us by telling my brother and myself, you're going to an integrated school. There are going to be white kids in that school with you. You'll get a better education. And that's what I thought. I didn't know any differently. I remember being in an English literature class in the, se in the uh, sixth grade, uh, seventh grade, something like that. Anyway, and my teacher, first ever white teacher I've ever had at this school, and I remember it was myself and another black young man that was in that class. Everybody else, maybe tw 10 children, the others were white. And I remember the teacher saying that first day, she said, class, we have new students with us today. We have Negroes joining us in our class today. And I didn't know, it didn't feel right within what she said. It just didn't feel right. But I remember my mother said, you're gonna get a better education. So I'm like, well, maybe this is the proper way to say Negroes. I did not think any more about that at all until I was a sophomore in college in undergrad and I was taking an English literature class and we were studying James, studying James Baldwin in one of the books that he had written, The Fire Next Time. And he mentioned the word Negress. And I reflected back to the seventh grade to know that was one of the words that were used to devalue, dehumanize black people. So. Um, I have another question for you. Um, Someone wrote in and asked if you could talk about discovering one of your own implicit bias and how you dealt with it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the thing about implicit bias is that it's so, it's so, un, it's unconscious. The, the systemic racism, you know, I can see that because I'm in the health field. You know, we talk about the disparities. It's very, very obvious, you know, these things, the policy that directs 
the plan and the practice, you know, essentially. Um, as far as my own personal experiences, there have been subtle things because they're what we call those micro triggers growing up in nurse as a nurse, you know, on different levels where I've seen white nurses, this is early on white nurses that worked alongside of me in the hospital, not necessarily in Asheville, but it was experienced in Asheville as well. And the white nurses were encouraged to apply for positions that they knew they were going to get. Whereas black nurses like myself came out with a bachelor of science degree. These nurses did not have a, they had associate degree. We as black nurses, those of bachelors were not even considered for any type of position or promotion. And I remember seeing the white nurses just moving up the ladders really quickly. And we were pretty much essentially staff nurses and pretty much had to fight our way to any level of promotion or acknowledgement. Remember the elephant in the room? Do you even see me? You know, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, is there any indication that the medical community is dealing with the inequities in the treatment of people of color? Uh, that's a huge question because yeah. that's no, at, at this point, and I can only speak locally, there are minimal voices of color represented around the table where decisions are made and what policies are written. You know, out of the, let's say, 800 positions in Western, well, I'm going to say Buncombe County and Buncombe County, um, only 3% are African American. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably 2% are Hispanic, maybe, maybe about the same as, um, you know, as African American, and less than 1% are American Indian, you know. So the representation, the voice that can promote what I call cultural congruence, that means to educate people, people who look like me, in with those patients and with those providers, those patients, I mean, those physicians and nurses that will help educate and help them to be a learner, to do better, you know, until um, we get that level of cultural congruence, then, you know, we don't really know what's happening around the table, but we can be a voice and teach what I do about cultural humility, what the steps are in, us, in order for us to do better. Hopefully when we know better, we do better. And then I have one last question for me, uh, for you. Can you tell a little bit about how the Republican Party seemed to be the party of choice, choice for blacks initially, and when that when did that change over to the Democratic Party? Yeah. So you know, it, as things changed, it became the Democratic Party became more progressive and more liberal, more egalitarian in the thought process. Even though there's still areas now that still. Um, are not the best and the most that will provide the, you know, fulfillment and to flourish, but still more so than the Republican. And the Republican Party became more, um, less, um, what I want to say, um, can't think of the word I want to say, but anyway, they become less, you know, open to equity and equality and and, and then just kind of pulled on some of what the Democratic Party first had, and that's just kind of the terrorists, the, the threats, the um, the lack of wanting to achieve equity for all. You know, it's like pulled the Republicans um, tended to move more towards pull yourself up by your bootstraps and not recognizing that there are social contributors and social determinants of health that determines the outcome of folks, that we all are not starting on equal playing fields. You know, that egalitarian period, you know, where everyone should strive for equity was missing out of that model. It, it's deep. It, you know, what I showed you today is just minimal mm -hmm. history, just a little broad stroke of history, but there's a lot more that took place. So. I have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, she, uh, this is from somebody on the inclusion committee. She said, um, she wondered why you think white people are trying to understand um, black bias, their black biases now. Do you think that's actually really happening? I mean, people seem to be struggling to, to grasp what's going on. And mm -hmm. I just wondered how you felt about that. Yeah, about why are white people now trying to understand what's happening? Yes. Well, it's, it's pretty much on the media. We know with the George Floyd incident, yes. you know, that triggered that with so many, Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. um, you know, all those that have been un yeah. unresolved essentially and, and a lot of stuff that's going on. That's been, and so with media, <clears throat> social media, 
putting it out there, people are now saying, what, can this really be happening? This is 2020. And those people who are empathetic, and, and here again, I wanna make sure that I'm clear that those people who are more intellectual in receiving this information and empathetic, it's okay. We all have to start somewhere. That's why I said at the beginning, we are at different levels of awareness. So you're gonna hear the term, oh, now we're woke. You know, so that means we're more aware and we wanna be more aware. And so people are jumping on board in support saying, look, we have a voice. If we're white and we're privileged, we have a voice and we're gonna add our voice to make sure the wrongs are right. We're gonna do whatever it takes. Tell me, as the question was earlier, tell me what I need to do to help this cause. You know, I don't wanna be a part of the problem. I wanna be a part of the solution. And I think these are just people, like in during the civil rights era, you know, Dr. King didn't march because of just black people, all people who were poor, who did not have a voice around the table. This is what it was all about. So you saw all kind of people marching those marches. This is exactly what's happening now. You know, people are jumping on board and saying, look, I'm in, whatever I need to do, but this is wrong. So this is my question. Do you feel like we're making progress? Hmm. Well, we're having discussions. We're talking <laughs> about it. You know, we're talking about it and we just have to not grow weary in well doing. <laughs> We have to be patient and we also have to be vocal, use our voices, what we have, and so that we can see a difference. We may not see the fulfillment of what we desire to achieve, you know, in our lifetime, but we are moving in the right direction. And you know, what excites me so much about this is seeing the young kids doing the protests that are now, not the agitators that are coming in tearing up things. But those people, those young kids who are going out with their, you know, with using their voice to say, you know, no, no justice, what is it? No, uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, but my, my daughter, I, when they first started the protest, and I know we got to go, when first started the protest here in Asheville, then I was walking downtown because, you know, I heard all these chants. So this is like day one of the protest downtown Asheville. And so I was walking in and I'm just kind of standing there. I'm like, yeah, no, no justice, no peace. That's it. No justice. And so I'm just standing there and then just kind of like in the background, like this is so beautiful seeing these young people of all races just in there just saying, this is what we mean. We're serious about this, you know. And so I called my daughter who lives in Atlanta and I said, look, guess what I just did? I was a part of protest. I was standing there saying, and she said, mom, mom, if you don't get home, you go home right now. But <laughs> only after you say no justice, no peace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is a great story. Thank you so much. The Thank inclusion you. committee is very grateful that you were came to speak with us. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Catherine. We could keep you here all day, but uh, maybe you'll come back. We'll come Maybe back. we'll come back and speak again. We we'll would love that. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Catherine, I'll turn it back over to you. Th again, thank you so much. Um, people have been asking, you know, can we post this? Can we find out more? So, I think you've inspired us for probably three years worth of work, and we will um, hold ourselves to doing it. Very good. Thank um, you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening in. And, and so, to share. Was, uh -huh. Go ahead. I'm uh, done. So, Jane Callis and uh, Dana Zar for working on this program. I really appreciate it. So thank you, Dr. West, and we uh, we hope our paths will cross many times. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye now.